Good evening and welcome to Arizona Illustrated for Thursday, the 8th of November, 2012. I'm Tony Paniagua. Jared Lee Lofner, the man who pleaded guilty in the shooting rampage of January 2011, has been sentenced to life in prison without parole. He was accused of killing six people and injuring 13 others, including former Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords. For the latest on this story, as well as developments from Tuesday's election and other news, please log on to our website, azpm.org, or you can listen to our sister radio station, NPR 89.1 FM. Americans have just re-elected their first biracial president in the nation's history, and while much progress has been made in race relations and issues dealing with discrimination and equal rights, the situation was extremely different just a few decades ago. Tonight, we are joined by Morris Thies. He is the founder and chief trial attorney of the Southern Poverty Law Center, which has been working on behalf of civil <clears> rights <throat> since the 1970s. Mr. Deese, thank you very much for being here. Glad to be here, Tony. So if you could briefly describe what the Southern Poverty Law Center is and what it does for people who still may not have heard about it. Well, the Southern Poverty Law Center founded in actually the early 70s. I've been doing this work since the mid-60s in the civil rights era. But the Southern Poverty Law Center is really three programs. We seek justice for those people who have a few champions. We fight hate by tracking and, and suing hate groups all over the United States, neo-Nazi, all those others. And we teach tolerance and acceptance in the classrooms with a major program used by about 80,000 schools in the country. We have been hearing a lot about this recent election and the white versus the minority divide when it came to uh, picking the president. What would you like to say about that? Well, you know, I think this election, even more so than Obama's first election, uh, is, is quite a, a, a uh, important and significant change. For the, I think for the first time, uh, we, we saw groups coming together, groups that are going to be major parts of our population in the future. Uh, gay lesbians, we saw Latinos, we saw African Americans, we saw low income. All these different groups came together to give him that victory. And when he was elected the first time, a lot of people wanted to see the first biracial or African American president, as you might say, elected. But then people kind of fell off of that. A lot of, even a lot of African Americans said, well, this guy's not strong enough for us, you know, he ought to be doing this. And, but, his, but also, the Republican Party went so far to the right and almost alienated everybody that basically all they got was the uh, white uh, male votes and a few others, and that's pretty much what it was. Do you think now that he's going to settle in for a second term, people will say, maybe we shouldn't put so much emphasis on his ethnicity, his race? He's just an average guy, average in quotation marks, trying to do what he thinks is yeah. right? President Obama has never put emphasis on his race. What he looks like is what he looks like. But he's pushed hard to have an agenda for, for all the people, especially for the middle class and low income people. And I think, I think as we move into this next election, those Tea Party people who took over Congress, the House of Representatives, are really back themselves into a corner because the candidates that appeal to them did so poorly in the, dem in the Republican process that they finally winded it down to Romney, who changed all of his positions to go to the far left to get right party, get the nomination, that uh, he was not electable. But none of those candidates have run against him. Gingrich and all the rest of them, they would have gotten trounced in, a, in election. So Republicans got a problem. And that, uh, those that control the House of Representatives now, if they don't meet in the middle and try to accomplish something to make this country move forward, they'll be uh, eliminated in the midterm election. As you travel the country, how confident are you that things will sort of coalesce in the future and will, everybody will get along, if you will? Well, you know, uh, it's mathematical things. Things revert to the mean. So, in other words, a pendulum swings both ways. I think we're at a, a point where we're going to have great progress. No matter who is president, quite honestly, the economy is going to pick up because it's already picking up. Uh, and, and that's going to benefit, clearly, Obama. And we're going to have to come up with a taxing system that makes everybody pay a fair share. And if that happens, uh, we'll dig our way out of this debt. It may be a long time. But the United States has a defense budget larger than the 10 largest other nations in the world. And there's nobody trying to attack us. We don't need submarines, nuclear submarines. For what? I mean, and sooner or later, we're going to realize that we need the kind of armies that can fight in Afghanistan and Iraq and, and not, not uh, more uh, aircraft carriers. All right. Well, Morris Thee, the, uh, Morris Thee is the founder-in-chief, trial attorney for the Southern Poverty Law Center. Thank you very much for being hey, here. You're welcome. Thank you for having me.
Even though most residents will be off for the Veterans Day holiday on Monday, November 12th, the official day is on Sunday, and here in Tucson, the Southern Arizona VA Healthcare System is holding its 2012 Veterans Celebration Day on Saturday. For more on that, we are joined by Adrian Weedy and Mark Mullick. Weedy is one of the event organizers, and Mullick is a combat veteran who attended the event last year. Thanks for being here. Thank you. It's nice to have Thank the you. opportunity to be here. All right, Adrian, let's begin with a little bit about the history of this celebration. How long has it been going on, and why hold this event? Well, about six years ago, we were asked to put a benefits fair together for veterans. And our facility looked at this as an opportunity to expand on, on the event and make it something much, much more than that. So in the six years since that time, we have developed this event into more than a benefits fair. We've included children's activities, uh, live entertainment, refreshments, and made it a day of fun for veterans, active duty service members, reservists, National Guard members, and their loved ones, so that everyone can come out, have fun, and learn about what's available to them as far as supportive services in the community, as well as with the VA. Okay, great. And Mark, obviously you attended last year, as I said in the introduction. What is your military background? Uh, you served in the Navy, and how long were you in? I was in 24 years. Um, enlisted in 1986, and uh, just retired here in uh, 2010. So I've been retired for a couple years. Um, I attended the uh, event last year, um, like, uh, like you alluded to, and uh, had a great time. And why would you recommend it to other veterans who may not even know about this function? Well, the event itself, for me, what I got out of it, uh, there's, there's a one-stop shop of a wealth of information there. Um, anything from uh, uh, VA benefits, uh, hospital um, uh, programs, community programs, I mean, it's all there in one, one place. You can get all the information you need. And we were speaking about that, Adrian, ahead of this interview, about how uh, civilians typically think veterans know exactly where to go for events or services or something like that, but that's not necessarily the case. No, there is a lot of information out there. It can be very overwhelming for someone who has just separated from the military. Also, we have a lot of National Guard members and reservists serving, and they may not have access to the same information that an active duty service member may have. Um, so our role really is to make sure that we have that information accessible to them. And this is one way that we do that by putting on this event where we have over 50 community organizations and 20 VA programs coming together in one day, one afternoon, um, just for the service members and veterans. Okay. And Mark, why do you think it is important that Veterans Day be celebrated at all? We know, uh, many of us, especially those of us who are veterans, that we should thank the people who have participated in the armed forces, but a lot of those the civilian population doesn't really think much about this day at all. Yeah, myself, I think it's very important to, uh, to recognize uh, all veterans. Um, again, we need to remember that uh, they volunteered to serve their country. Um, and, and with that, uh, protecting our freedoms and our way of life here in America. So I, I think it's very important that we we uh, come out and, and celebrate that. And Adrian, what do you tell us a little bit about the actual location, time, and so on for this event on Saturday? Well, this year is actually our first year that we're going to have it at the Tucson VA Medical Center in the Sports Park, which is at 3601 South 6th Avenue. And the best way to enter is through the 6th Avenue entrance. Um, although if you enter from either gate, you'll be fine. You'll be able to access the event. Um, we are really thrilled to have it at our home facility because it's a way for veterans to also see what the facility looks like. It's beautiful, and then they can also learn about what's available to them in their community um, in the way of supportive services. And what are the hours, and is the public invited to attend as well? It is open to everybody, but we are targeting active duty service members, National Guard members, reservists, veterans and their loved ones. Uh, the event will be held this Saturday from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. Okay, great. And Mark, what would you like to tell other veterans who may not have uh, heard about this event or participated? Would you encourage uh, him or her to be there and try to find out about what's going on here in Tucson? Absolutely. Like I said, uh, just putting the, the aside the, the amount of information that you can get out of this, this event, uh, just to go and, and talk to other veterans and get their stories. Uh, that was the highlight for me last year. 
Excellent. Well, thank you very much for being here and congratulations on your service. Thank you for your service and good luck with the event thank on you. Saturday. Thank, thank you. you. Appreciate thank you. it. We are now in the best months to explore the great outdoors in Southern Arizona. And tonight we have a story about an annual tradition at a popular destination west of Tucson. The Arizona Sonora Desert Museum holds raptor free flights from October until April. And here's a look at some of the amazing action from these captivating birds. This segment is produced by Tom Clespie and Martin Rubio and narrated by Dan Cruz. You know them when you see them. There's no mistaking birds that are built to eat flesh. They're fast and fearless, and they carry their own weapons. We call them raptors. That's Latin for seize or plunder, and it's the name for what we call birds of prey. Many humans are oblivious to the raptor's presence, and others want to get as close as possible. In the raptor's world, the females are larger than the males. You can't get any closer than at the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum, west of Tucson. Featuring orphaned birds unable to be returned to the wild, the experience truly lives up to its name. Raptor Free Flight. Good morning. Can you all hear me? I'm Carol, and I don't volunteer with Raptor Free Flight. We can't restrain the birds, so when they're loose, they're loose. They can take off and go anywhere they want to go. These birds are going to be flying all around you and very, very, very close to you. Sometimes they dart right in between people. Oh, look right over our head. They treat the, the public, the audience, as they would a group of bushes or something like that. You never know what will happen, so you really can't have a prepared speech and sometimes you have to tap dance. You just have to wing it with the bird. The unpredictable stars of the show include a special gray hawk. I think it's the only one free flying in the country to my knowledge. There's about 80 nesting uh, pair here in Southern Arizona. One of the strongest of all raptors, a great horned owl. They live in any type of habitat in Arizona, including the city. A hawk named for its rusty color, the ferruginous hawk the largest type of hawk in North America, about four, four and a half foot wingspan, really impressive bird. The bird with Hollywood's most famous and overused hawk call, the red-tailed. The most common of the large hawks that you'll find anywhere in the country, and she's trained to soar a thousand feet or more above the desert floor here, and then dive down in a pretty spectacular dive to the glove. One of the fastest animals on earth, the prairie falcon. And the prairie falcon um, can fly at speeds over 200 mile, miles an hour. And one of the most commonly seen urban hawks, the Harris's. And they're unique in that the fact that they're the one of only two species of raptor in the entire world that live and hunt in these uh, family groups. And it's more um, evolved here in the Sonoran Desert than anywhere else in the world. And we think it's a direct adaptation for the difficulty uh, that they face hunting in the cactus forest here. Sometimes if the whole family sees the prey move, They'll all converge on it at once and attempt to keep it from gaining cover. All this swooping, soaring, diving, and aerial acrobatics is immensely entertaining and awe-inspiring. But there's also a deeper purpose. At the end of the day, you know, it really doesn't matter to me personally if people can remember how many eggs the birds lay, you know, what kind of prey that they capture. As long as they leave at the end of the day with this newfound awe and appreciation for the natural world that we live in. If you enjoy animals and what they do and, and, and them and their, their best, I mean, this is it. I mean, it really is. I thought I was going to get hit by one of them. It was like so the close. Last time my husband and I were out here, the Harris Hawk went vertically right between our heads. Don't miss it. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. Awesome flight photo opportunity. If you see a beautiful flower or a rock or an artifact, leave it. 
take pictures of it? It's a conservation message, I think. And not just uh, conserving raptors. None of the species we use are endangered or anything like that, um, but more conserving and appreciate, uh, appreciating the natural world. The sights and sounds from Raptor Free Flight often leave deep and lasting impressions, no matter if it's your first time or your hundredth. It's always a magical experience to me. Um, that's the biggest thing. That's that's the kind of the key word that always comes to mind. Is you know I've never um, outgrown or uh, conceptualized completely the fact that we can create this bond with a wild animal. Again, that quintessential wild animal. Those hawks, eagles, falcons, owls. Um, turn them loose and have them decide to fly back. And it's just it teaches you not only a lot about the natural world and how um, animals operate, but also how to uh, better build relationships and keep relationships with people in your personal life. And hope you get brushed by a feather so you can have 25 years of good luck, okay? <laughs> We hear about many celebrations in Southern Arizona that highlight the rich cultural diversity of this region. And tonight we'll tell you about FinFest. It is being held this weekend and it focuses on one of the beautiful Scandinavian countries that has contributed to the culture of the United States. Caitlin Harrington has that interview. In studio with me now is Stephanie Koskinen. She is the local coordinator for the 2012 FinFest. Thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having us. Um, Stephanie, first, start by telling our audience um, where and when the FinFest 2012 will take place. Okay, all the activities are going to take place at the Double Tree Reed Park. That's on Alvernon, just south of Broadway. Um, it's from November 8th to 11th. And um, the FinFest is hosting a bunch of activities over those couple of days. Um, everything from education to arts and crafts to music. Mm -hmm. um, so can you go into a little bit of detail on when some of those events will take place? Okay. Um, the first thing we'd like to highlight is, uh, because we're doing it in conjunction with U of A, is a special education seminar and workshop for teachers, aspiring teachers, and anyone who's interested in education. Um, you can get seven uh, professional credit hours from U of A, uh, and it's going to, the keynote speaker is Passi Salberg, who's been noted in the New York Times um, and international press for being one of the leaders in the Fed Finnish educational system, which is consistently ranked as one of the highest in the world. So there are going to be U.S. teachers using the model, um, and, as well as local teachers taking part, and um, some teachers from Finland speaking about their experiences. So that should be really good. Um, and you can register on the day, too, if you want to show up at 9 o'clock. Uh, there's a lunch included. Um, from 9 to 5.30... Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, we have a free marketplace that's open to anyone who wants to sample finished food. There will be food demos, musical performances, a kid's corner with some craft activities, um, and of course, vendors so you can buy your finished design if you like, Marimeko or Itzala Glass. Uh, so uh, stop, anyone can stop by uh, to that and just get a taster of what um, a finished Finnish American culture and just mingle. And Stephanie, we talked uh, prior to this interview about the ways that you're trying to incorporate um, or make it so that it's interactive for not only Finnish but American culture. Mm -hmm. um, so tell me a little bit about some of the uh, music and performers that will be happening. Okay. Um, for example, we will have some local performers. Um, many of them are uh, Finnish American or you know Nordic American. Uh, however, we are having uh, a big dance uh, and also a free market performance as well uh, from... Um, Gertie and the T.O. Boys, a Wyla band uh, that's actually performing with Finn Hall, which is a Finnish-American band. There are a lot of similarities in the music there, so we're hoping that it'll make for a great show. And there's a lot of similar dancing, to partner dancing. Uh, so check on the website for that as well. Um, and there's also a lecture. We're having lots of lectures on different topics, um, as uh, from art and design to uh, history to architecture to uh, science. And then we're also having... Um, a doctor who is speaking about men's health issues, um, both men in Finland and also um, Native American population health. And uh, he's worked on reservations. I've, and uh, so he that should be an interesting um, reaching out to the culture. Also, there is a connection to Bisbee. Uh, there were many Finnish immigrants in um, Bisbee working in the mines alongside people from all over the world. Um, and so there will be a special trip. That's the only thing um, that's not at the hotel on Sunday. And you can register for that. I think there are just a few spots left. Um, Stephanie, a majority of the events at the FinFest are going to be free, but there are some mm -hmm. ticketed um, events as well. Um, can you tell our audience about what some of the events were where they'll have to purchase tickets in advance? Sure. 
Um, the ticketed events are basically you can buy a day pass or the four day pass, which includes um, all the lectures during the day and some musical performances as well during the day. There are some evening events um, that are cost extra, um, but pretty much everything that goes on during the day, and that includes films. I should also mention that there's film series as well for film lovers. Um, lectures and day performances are all included in that price. Um, and like I said, the marketplace is free. And I should mention that it is also open on Sunday, but from nine to three. So there are free and non-free events. And the FinFest is a, a traveling fest that mm -hmm. every year you pick kind of a different location. Um, and we talked about why Tucson was one of those. And you did mention um, the miners in Bisbee. Mm -hmm. um, but how did this festival come to Tucson this year? Well, there are local clubs, uh, Finnish American clubs here in Tucson and also in Phoenix. So if anyone's interested, look them up. Um, and I think they knew the heads of FinFest and they got talking and I think they promoted Tucson as a good uh, venue. So um, and I think people will be excited about the good weather we have here. Um, Stephanie, for people who want to find out a little bit more information, can you tell our audience about your website? Sure. It's www. 2012finfestusa.org. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks. People who really love coffee never need an excuse to savor their favorite beverage, but a new local event is hoping to inspire more than just passionate drinkers to indulge. Several local coffee houses will be participating in the first Tucson Coffee Crawl this Saturday, November 10th. Here is Mark McLemore to tell us more. And here to tell us more about this weekend's coffee crawl, we have the originator and organizer behind the event, Laura Adams, and Ari Shapiro, who owns Spark Crew, one of the participating locations that will be serving coffee on Saturday. So Laura, tell me, what's the origin of this idea? Yeah, so I'm a freelancer. I spend a lot of my office time in various coffee shops around town. And I realized in befriending baristas, talking to people that are there at the coffee shop, that I know next to nothing about coffee. It really is quite an art and a craft, and I wanted to learn more about it, and I thought that maybe other people would also. So in addition to just experiencing the different coffee shops and getting out, you have sort of an educational thrust to what's going to happen. I do, especially with what you call third wave coffee. There's, like I said before, there is a craft involved in this. There's a very specific way that the roasters treat the beans. There's a specific way that you grind it. And most of the shops that are participating make every cup of coffee to order. There's not a giant vat of coffee that they're pulling from. Um, so along with that, I wanted to host cuppings and tastings and comparative tastings to really educate people um, on the nuances of coffee. Well, how did you go about organizing the event? Did you find community partners to support you? What I did is I actually approached all of the different owners of the coffee shop, Ari from Spark Group being one of them, and just asked them if they would be on board for something like that, if they wanted to host different workshops or demos to help educate people about coffee, and they were all pretty excited to join. Well, Ari, how do you view this opportunity? What does it mean to Spark Root to be a participant? Well, I think that for Spark Root and all the participating coffee shops and roasters, it's a wonderful opportunity to, you know, uh, show Tucson that the coffee culture in this town has really taken off in the last few years. You know, I'd say there's been more development in the last two to three years than, you know, in the many years prior, just with uh, Spark Root opening, Cartel, you know, EXO, and um, all the others that are involved in this. So, you know, it's a great launching pad uh, to, to get the word out to a wider audience. And so we're really looking forward to being a part of it. Well, tell us a little bit about Spark Root itself and, and kind of what your approach to serving coffee is like there. Spark Root's approach is part of the you know, third wave or specialty market of, of coffee, uh, meaning that we take a great amount of care in the roasting process, the equipment process that we use to, to brew the coffee, and the uh, barista training. And that, of course, also goes back to step one, which is the beans coming from very select farms. And everything we do is fair trade and organic. Uh, we happen to be purveyors of blue bottle coffee um, based in Oakland and San Francisco, who's one of the preeminent roasters in this sort of uh, specialty coffee movement. And um, yeah, it's just, you know, we take a lot of care in it. And I think that uh, the coffee crawl will be a great opportunity to, to show some of the care that we put into it. What's a quick tip you might give to someone who drinks coffee to help them be a more informed consumer? Um, well, you can maybe parallel it to like what's happened with wine or with micro beers lately that, 
you know, if, if maybe you cut back the volume a little bit and you concentrate on quality over quality, um, you know, you're not going to really get like endless cups of coffee at any of these places. It's more about having one or, or two cups and really, really, you know, drinking it slowly, enjoying it, uh, you know, getting the aromas and all the flavors that are in there. And that's the other thing is our coffee is very stripped down. We don't use any sweeteners or syrups or anything like that. So you're really getting the essence of the coffee bean. Well, let's tell uh, people who may be thinking about participating in the coffee crawl what to expect from the event. Absolutely. The crawl is really set up to, to map your own crawl. You can kind of decide your own pace. So if you go online to TucsonCoffeeCrawl.com, we have a list there of all of the different demonstrations and workshops that are happening. You can go there, decide to at 9 a.m. you want to go to Cartel, at 11.15 you want to walk down to Spark Route, um, and sort of on, at your own pace decide what events you'd like to go to. And you don't have to go to an event at every place as well. You can just go and check out the atmosphere and order a cup of coffee if you'd like to. What about uh, transportation between these uh, different sites? Yes, the entire crawl is bikeable and most of the crawl is walkable. Again, we have a map on our website that you can go and decide what's going to be possible. But um, yeah. And how many participating locations are there? We have seven, di seven different locations. Uh, and give our audience an idea of the cross streets, kind of where this uh, area w would be around. Absolutely. I think Spark, Spark is kind of like in the middle of the downtown section. So if you head down Congress, you can do Spark Root, Brood, um, Yellow Brick Coffee will be tasting out of 47 Scott Restaurant. You can go down 6th Avenue and head EXO. So it's kind of that downtown Congress area. Then the other two shops are going to be located on Campbell and Grant. That's where, Exo, that's where um, Cartel and Roast Raging Sage are both located. Can you think of a challenge that you faced in uh, setting this up, or have you found the coffee dealers and the public to be receptive? I found both to be extremely receptive. A lot of the coffee shops are already doing a lot of educational type events at their shops, so to be able to do it all together on one day and really gar like, generate a big crowd, they were all pretty on board for. And we've had a much larger than anticipated response online. There seems to be quite a lot of people in Tucson that are very interested in coffee, so it's been exciting. Well, really quickly, tell us, what are your ideas for the future of this event? Are you calling it the first annual? It is the, the first annual, and given the response that we've had so far, I absolutely think that it's possible to do something like this again next year. I hope that it can grow. Well, Laura, thanks so much for sharing uh, your inspiration for us and Ari for information about coffee. Thank thanks you. for having us. Coming up tomorrow night, Jim Ninsel and guests will join us on the Arizona Illustrated Political Roundtable. They'll examine the results of Tuesday's election and possible repercussions. I'm Tony Paniagua from all of us at Arizona Public Media. Have a great night.